and we'll give it one more minute and then we'll start. Um, just to let you all know that we will be doing one more data semester uh, training next month. Then the next semester of training is going to be focused on political stuff. Um, we're going to do a panel on how to survive covering election year with some really great um, political reporters. We're going to do a Federal Elections Commission uh, campaign finance deep dive, probably with IRE. And then uh, we're also going to do a session on something called pro-democracy reporting, which is an interesting um, approach to that sort of uh, that that sort of mitigates against the idea that you have two sides to every story and that we have to treat this election like any election. Um, you know, there's a lot of um, discussion on both sides of the aisle uh, or the party or the spectrum that democracy is at stake, right? So um, how do journalists engage with that? Um, that's kind of an interesting um, an interesting theme. So that's going to be our politics semester. I don't know what order that's going to be in yet. But um, anyway, I'm going to um, go ahead and ask Daniel to share his screen. I think it's still enabled. And uh, we can get started. There it is. Hi, everybody. Welcome to the second of three trainings about data journalism. And this one, we're really going to get our hands dirty and talk about data wrangling. So it's probably something you haven't really thought about. Like, why does data need to be wrangled? I thought data was just out there and fine. In reality, data is always incredibly messy because the way it is gathered and the way it is, exists in a given data set is unique to that organization, individual, or purpose. So we often need to transform that data into whatever we need to do to ask the same journalism questions that we do of a source. It's always helpful to remember that even though data can seem scary, in reality, it's the same thing as a source. It's just a really weird source that you have to learn its own language to communicate with. But in the end, the journalism is the same. And this is just the process of kind of getting that annoying source to talk to you. So here's a kind of walk through of what we're doing. So this is kind of a broad definition of what data journalism is. First, we got to wrangle it. So this is the importation of the data, taking whatever we have and having it in our own software, be it Excel, Google Sheets, R, Python, whatever, tidying it. So making those changes. So we are making sure that the data types are correct. Everything is consistent. So we can begin our analysis, begin to transform it, and then begin ask those questions of, what is this telling me? What are the outliers? What's the mean, median, and mode? To then we have those pieces of information that we either turn to a data visualization or something else, like just a couple paragraphs in a story. Um, but it's important to kind of separate these things at once because this is part of why when I'm working with reporters, I need to have some lead time to actually analyze and clean the data because I want to make sure I'm doing this correctly and separating out the importation wrangling section from the analysis and the visualization, make sure that I don't make any key mistakes. But it's important to remember that this is more than just talking to a person and recording something for a cut and copy or a spot. It's a whole process that has to be done correctly to make sure that you don't make any mistakes. So let's go through some best practices. And kind of in general, this talk is gonna start somewhat general with some kind of big themes, and then we'll get to specific softwares and applications. First, convince your IT department that you have admin rights in your computer, because I'm gonna be talking about a number of software that you need to have to transform whatever wacky thing you have from the government or from a nonprofit or whatever, and make it usable. None of these are big, complicated packages. I'm not asking you to install things directly in the terminal, but you will need more than what your IT department just gives you in order to actually wrangle data. So uh, let's say you've gone and submitted your public records request. You've got that data back. The first thing you've got to do is make sure you know what it actually is, because sometimes in that communication from that request and that communication that likely goes from the PIO to the people they supervise, there's a chance a mistake happened. So whenever you get that information back from a records request, make sure that you know it is actually what you asked for. Do some spot checks, look at the top, the bottom, and double check that what you requested is entirely in there because that would be a waste of time if you spend you know, even a day on a data set that's incomplete. It's best to make sure you're on the same page. You can move on after you've kind of verified that information. And if you're experiencing some problems with sources, um, I often ask to have an on-background conversation with an expert to make sure that I'm correct. And I frame it as, hey, 
this is me doing journalism. I want to make sure I don't make a mistake. I'm not looking to quote you in a story or anything, but I want to make sure the information that you gave me is what I thought it was. So I don't make any basic errors just based on a misunderstanding. And additionally, especially things from large governmental organizations, they often have what's called a readme file, which explains their database schema, the file types, any weird information. So if you're downloading something from a data set, it's important to look at that readme so you're not surprised by anything. This is particularly common in large data sets that have lots of variables, because even though we as humans like to read a lot of text, have details that explains, oh, this column is this specific thing, this column is that specific thing, Computers don't like having all that text, so that's why it tends to be very short and almost like code language of just, you know, instead of percent space change, which is 10-ish characters, you may have PCTCH, which is the same concept, just shrunk. And it just helps with readability and file size and that kind of thing. So it's also important to understand your data provenance. So when you've got something, who made it? How is it collected? How often is it updated? What biases does this data have? What information do I need to know so when I put it in a story, it's in the right context? In the right context. I think the biggest example is, uh, Holly, I'm getting some echo from you, um, is data sets that are constantly updated. That's when it's really important to make sure that you're said that this is the data as of date, rather than someone who reads this, you know, two months, six months from now and is confused as to why it doesn't have, you know, something that, that's reflective of the past. Um, and it's always important to consider the biases of the data because everyone makes mistakes and mistakes can cascade. So it is sometimes possible that the information that you have is just not as clean as what you think you may have. It's also important whenever you get that records request back is to save an untouched copy locally. Even before you open it, create a new folder on Google Drive or whatever and save it so you have that just in case. Because Every once in a while, you're making a mistake in the wrangling process where you need to go back and check the original. And you should never do anything on data you don't have a backup of because nothing would be more awkward than, you know, fighting for weeks to get some data from an organization and then having to go back to them and saying, hey, I made a mistake. Can you send that to me again? They won't be very happy and you'll feel very stupid. So make sure you have that copy locally, um, preferably on your computer rather than in a cloud because, you know, some random AWS surge outage can mean you don't have access for that data when you need. And I also find it useful um, to keep this in like a storage space because sometimes you get a new PIO and they're like, no, why would we give this to you? It's sometimes effective to say, hey, you've given this, your predecessor gave this to me months ago. It's the same thing. It's fine. It can speed up the process. And also if you're working on a regional story, I find it helpful to pit states against each other. So when Nebraska is being annoying, I'm like, well, Iowa gave this to me easy enough. I would just like something similar to it. And usually that rubs in the right way. So they finally do what they say. So sometimes you got to use uh, some of those um, aggressive negotiations to get information from PIOs. So another concept that's important to understand whenever you need to wrangle data is the concept of tidy data. Governments just love wacky formatting, be it a lot of headers, subheaders, color coding, variety of dates. People love to get pretty with their sheets, which is a massive mistake in my opinion, because it's difficult for us to understand what they were trying to communicate by making it a sheet a certain way. So one of the things you need to do first with tidy data is first look at the corners. Is there anything weird at the bottom? Anything weird at the top? If it's a very wide data set, so it has tons and tons of rows, scroll all the way to the end of that row and make sure it looks okay because sometimes a formatting error can push data in weird places and it could be uneven. And that means you're gonna to have to be a little bit more careful in cleaning it rather than one that is entirely tidy. So the diagram on the right describes what a tidy data set is. So the variables are the rows, the observations are the columns, and the values are the information within the cell. This is an easy way so you can use pivot tables, a variety of different analysis tools to quickly look at the data. And it basically uh, makes it a little bit more um, clean to understand. So um, one other thing you need to be aware of, especially if you get an Excel document, is confirm that there aren't any what I call live formulas. So when you type the equal sign in a formula, that will activate a formula. So you could do anything from just simple addition, subtraction to stats even in Excel. But that information is displayed as a value, but it isn't saved as a value. So if you move something around, 
that formula doesn't know you did it. So it could completely screw up the entire data set. So what you do there is you copy and paste that information, that column that has that, that formula in it as values, and it turns it from the code that's obscured to the actual data. And then you can do whatever you want with afterwards. It's important to look because sometimes sources will forget to do this and it can completely change what they're trying to send to you. And kind of, as I said before, remove extra headings and different formattings, convert color coding into data, make sure dates are consistent and the NAs or blanks or nulls are consistent just so everything is easy for a computer to understand and is also easy for you to read. So when you go back and double check, did I import this information correctly? You know you did because it is a tidy data set. <clears throat> so the second thing you need to do is smell your data because something is fishy in there, you need to understand it. This is an idea kind of born out of exploratory data analysis, which is a concept that was defined by statistician Jonathan Tukey in the 70s, which is basically whenever you have a data set, it's important to run the basic statistical tests. So the mean, median, mode, standard variation. Obviously, you don't need to do this all the time, but if you have something huge from a government, it's useful to do these tricks just to make sure there isn't anything extremely wacky. But in this con concept, there is a big difference between data journalists and data scientists. Data scientists are more likely to remove outliers and focus on trends. This obviously doesn't work for journalism because those outliers are usually our story. So, you know, if a property sells for an incredibly large amount, if there's a massive amount of donations to a certain political candidate, that's a story, while a statistician would say, ah, it's an outlier, we should kill it. So it's important to conceptualize the extremes here because chances are those outliers are a story for something else. Um, but in general, it's important to conceptualize your data just like a source. Is there anything that doesn't make sense or something that's confusing that could potentially screw up something later? And once you have an understanding of the data, once it's tidy, it's kind of easy to check for these things. And honestly, just trust your gut. Like if I saw, you know, a population spike in North Platte, Nebraska, I'd be like, well, it has to be some kind of error. I don't think, you know, 200,000 people suddenly showed up in the middle of the state. Just, um, it's important to approach data with common sense. So I often find it helpful to, you know, do a little bit of the project, do the, the cleaning, the analysis, get a cup of coffee, chill for a minute, let your brain reset, and then take a look at it with a fresh brain to double check that you didn't make any mistakes when you were going through the process. So uh, now that we've kind of covered the basic conceptualization of data wrangling, we're gonna get into some specific examples and specific tools to solve all these problems. All of these tools are fairly simple to use and they're mostly like point and click tools, so nothing too complicated, but I will mention some things that are more advanced that if you run into, just shoot me an email, we can work, work it out. Um, I don't do the super advanced stuff very often, but I do know how to do it. Um, I, I'm taking some courses. I am decent enough at R and Python that if I need to write a script to do something, I can. But thankfully, it's not something I do every day because that's not the best thing in the world to do. So uh, just starting off with a useful tool for getting tables off the internet. So this is called the import HTML tool. So what you do is you find your table on a website and you open it with the inspect elements tool in your web browser. In Google Chrome, you could just search inspect elements and it'll pop up. And you'll have this screen that it appears. You can hover over and find the identification number of that table. And then using this formula, which I have highlighted in the screenshot, put that URL in there, and then this table will automatically populate inside of Google Sheets. And it's actually very similar in Excel. It's just slightly different formatting. Um, this mostly works on sites that are kind of simply designed. Like this won't really work on something that's in an embed or like a data wrapper or something like that. But if you just see a regular old table, you can just live scrape it this way. So this example here comes from the assessors of the county that Memphis is in. And I was able to get all of the names of the Vinebrook LLC, which is a story we did last year, just using this one simple formula line. And obviously this is live. Um, Google doesn't spam sites consistently, but I would estimate anywhere between from five to 10 minutes, this would update again. So it would be important for me to copy and paste this information, paste as values into a new sheet. So I have that information. And it would also be important to note, I grab this at this date because obviously, people buy and sell property, this data is going to, to, to change. But it's also important to remember that this is a formula. 
So if you copy and paste it and don't do paste as values, it will keep that formula and it will be live. So it's important to kind of transform that coding, that formula into actual data in a sheet. Um, so after I go through all of these specific examples, I'll pause for questions. Uh, any questions on how this works? I'll take that as a no. And feel free to use the chat. I have that up so I can see if you want to ask a question that way. So um, the next thing I'm going to talk about is advanced text editing tools. So the giant screenshot you're seeing there is the underlying data for a map I did a couple of weeks ago for Rick Brewer, who was doing a story with Harvest. And this is the location of forests across the US. So this is the GeoJSON file. So it has this kind of annoying notation called object notation. So that's why you see the type feature properties and then all the brackets and whatever. But when you get to the right with the locations and the names, that kind of looks like a spreadsheet just with a lot of extra information. So if I needed to transform this into a CSV, there are a number of tools that I can take to transform this format into a regular spreadsheet. So it's important to remember that pretty much every data type that you see is likely what's called a delimited file. So you've probably heard of a CSV, which is a comment separated values file. There are other ones too, tabs, you can use parentheses, braces, brackets. All of these are basically the same idea. You just usually need to transform it into a CSV because that's kind of the basic data format across nearly every service. Um, so if you have a data set that's like a tab limited file, all you have to do inside of your Excel is select the import option and you'll have a dialog box which appears, which you can put your delimiter in there, which it has the most common ones, parentheses, brackets, quotation marks, and then it will import that information just as you specified. Um, there are numbers of, of different ways to do this, but this is kind of the easiest way. Additionally, you can also copy and paste this into a sheet and then use the text to columns tool, which is the same thing as importation. You just do it within the sheet. Um, if you have a large file, it would make more sense to use the import function. But if you only had like, you know, 80, 100 things, it's fine to use the text to columns tool. There are other ways to kind of grab data that's in funky formats like this. Um, you could pull it into a text editor like Sublime Text or uh, Microsoft Visual Studio Code, which is what you're seeing in this screenshot as well. And you're able to use what's called a regular expression to grab that information out and you can put it into a new sheet. I won't go over regular expressions. They're basically like structured query language on steroids, but they are incredibly useful for grabbing very specific lines of text which if anything is formatted consistently, you're able to do. Um, so for Visual Studio Code, if you have a Windows account, which all of you do, you're able to download this. And it's useful for opening up any kind of wacky data file because it can also do you know, coding languages like Python and HTML and things like that. But you can also open up text files. And if you really wanted to, swap out some weird delimiter for a comma to make this information a little bit more clear. Um, but Again, if you have a piece of data that's just really in a confusing format, feel free to bother me and we can work it out. Um, sometimes, you know, you need to get creative with getting the end result of whatever you need to display. And this is kind of a solution two or three. This isn't my first thing I will do, but it is important to know that it is possible in most cases to extract information out of wacky file formats. So the next one I want to talk about is a tool called Open Refine. It's been around for a little over 10 years, and it used to be called Google Refine. And basically, it's a way to clean up extremely messy human-created data. Any human-created data set will contain spelling errors. Like if I told you, type your name 100 times in a spreadsheet, you're probably going to make a typo about the fifth or sixth time because that's just humanity. That's how our fingers work. So what Open Refine does is you can import a data set and run a quick analysis on it. And it will tell you, hey, I think these things are close enough that they may actually be the same thing. So I use the example of St. Louis in which it could be spelled a number of ways. It could be the Saint.Louis, it could be the full world, it could be the, you know, just no space and also typos. So what this tool can do is let us know what those likely like things are, and you can quickly edit them. So instead of having, oh no, there's a million more cities in this list than there should be, you can reduce it to what the reality even is. So um, for this example, this is some crime data from Nebraska. And as you can see, people type in the crime itself 
a bajillion different ways. So this algorithm can go through and find the ones that are the same thing and automatically clean this data set. This is incredibly useful for agencies that don't really care about clean data. I mean, police departments and sheriff's departments are kind of the prime example because it doesn't matter to them if you know a typo was made in, in the charging document um, because they're not providing those reports. So this is a way to kind of quickly clean up and speed the cleaning of the data. Um, I have the links to all of the tools in this spreadsheet in this um, slideshow, which I'll share in the end. And you could download Open Refine on your computer. Um, one thing that it does do is it runs inside of a browser. Um, so it is kind of funky if you haven't done that thing before. Or if you want to be uh, you know, a real code guy, you can just type in that uh, little sentence in your terminal. And it'll install. So here's another example of Open Refine kind of live. Um, so it has all of these different things that are faceted of this thing is one concept, but they typed it in wrong. And I could just quickly click that merge thing and it would turn those 32 different ways of saying possession of meth and put it all into one. And there are different ways of, of doing this. There are different options, but this is kind of the most useful and most likely one that you're going to use when you have extremely large and dirty data. So this is also important to you know keep that original version because you are doing some significant work changing this document and you wanna make sure you don't make any key mistakes. So once you're done cleaning it, it's important to go back on the original one and do that data smell again. Did the transformations that I made make sense? And if not, something went wrong in the process. But whenever you get anything large from a source or a government or whatever, uh, feel free to reach out and we can easily clean this into something that is usable for reporting or visualization or whatever. So another common problem in data world is getting information that's just an image. Like sometimes you get a, what's called a flat PDF, which the computer reads the same way it would read a PNG or a JPEG file. And obviously you can't copy and paste that into an Excel document. So there's a tool called optical character recognition, which back in the day, there was only a number of somewhat expensive tools to use. But thankfully within Excel, there is now a tool that can read most small tables and import them as data. So this is just a screen grab from a Microsoft's website, which you can even just take a photo and it can read it. Um, the accuracy is all right. It's not perfect. Um, it'll most often screw up um, with certain characters. So if you have a curly quotes or quotes, it can pull it in and it says the wrong Unicode character. Like we've probably all seen a weird website where like all the apostrophes are this weird symbol. And that's just a Unicode error of the web the website didn't know which font it was using. So it got confused. So it spit up the error. That's the most common thing that happens when you use OCR tools. And obviously different tools have different advantages, but for something small, I just recommend using Excel um, for things that are complicated, or let's say you had like a 500 page PDF, that's when you're going to want to use either a coding tool to solve this problem and read this information, especially if it's handwritten. Um, and Amazon has a really good AI powered OCR tool as well. That's even more accurate than any of these, but it does cost money to use. And I'd have to submit that to do it, but there is a way to get information out of tables that doesn't involve typing it. Because if you type it, chances are you're going to make a mistake. So it's better to use a digital tool and then fact check and correct those errors so it comes in evenly. But I think the most important thing when you're importing anything that you need to use an OCR tool for is to make sure you have enough space, white space, so it knows where to have that next kind of row of data. Because if you have it too zoomed in, it can get kind of confused. It may not know it's, a, it's a, the next row. So make sure you have some white space in there and it typically works. There's also a tool called Tabula, which does the same thing by either detecting lines or tables. And it works similarly to Open Refine, um, in which it runs inside of your browser, but you have to install it on your computer. Um, but it hasn't been updated since like 2018 because Excel and these other tools have become much more common and more useful. So I'd recommend just kind of sticking with Excel um, for using this whenever you have anything that's a small table. But obviously, if you know, you know, the Kansas City Police Department gives us, you know, a giant stack of PDFs, that's when we're going to have to do something a bit more complicated to export and OCR this information to something usable. Additionally, you can also use um, Adobe PDF, which you can export tables into Excel documents. Um, that is hit or miss because that one does function a lot like Tabula and focuses on those lines and tables, which with wacky formatting, which some PDFs has, it can get into an Excel document, but it may not be usable. So um, 
it's important to kind of ask yourself, how do I transform this in the way that'll be the easiest for me to work with? So that'll determine which OCR tool you want to use. Um, and I'll also uh, give another chance for questions. Any questions on OCR technology? All right, we can move on. So another common thing that you see, especially now that Esri has become really big, is open data sites on Esri. So Esri is a data science company that is mostly focused on geospatial data. So it usually has everything in a map. But um, this is a screenshot from Missouri Spatial Data Information Service. And I'm able to get a number of government data sets quite easily from this. So basically all that you have to do is learn how to navigate this site where you can download this information in, in PDFs and in CSVs, shape files if you wanna get complicated. And it is relatively easy to use. But the one thing about Esri is that it's not the most transparent company and governments often obscure what you can and can't download from their open data tool. It's kind of a cop out. It's like they create this open data tool, but it actually isn't open. It's just, you could see it, but only, only through these rules that they create. Um, but if you're able to download directly from the open data site, it usually does work pretty clean, cleanly. And additionally, sometimes they hide this information on a, what's called an Esri REST server, which it's possible to extract data of, but it's kind of complicated, so we won't get into it. But in general, if there's an open data site, you're usually able to download CSVs or shape files, which have information. So just to explain, most shape files are the same thing as a CSV. It just has that geography to it, which can be read in a number of ways. So what you're seeing here is vector data of the school districts in Missouri. So if you're looking at it in a tabular form, you would see all the school district information you'd expect, but it would have that object ID, which would have that geometry that a geospatial tool will be able to read and project on a map. So you can just download that information, ignore the geography, and just look at the information like a tabular data set, and it functions exactly the same. Um, I often find that GIS people tend to be a little bit more open when it comes to sharing data because a lot of GIS is very open source. So I often find if you're able to circumvent a PIO and talk to a GIS person directly, they're often more likely to give you information than going through the official process. Obviously make that decision based on your information and your relationship with the organization, but it has worked for me in the past. Um, there used to be a very active GIS and mapping Twitter and that was helpful for getting information about wildfires and things like that. But um, it's important to remember that even though this data is very spatial, there is also tabular stuff, which is usually what we're using in journalism. So we can download information from Esri and use it for our stories. So one other thing I want to also talk about is dashboards, which dashboards, in my opinion, aren't data. It's just a presentation. It's like this, our, or this organization, this government, has already made all the decisions for us to bake that information, and it's only showing us the end result, not the information behind it. So there are kind of two main dashboards that exist on the internet right now. Tableau used to be really big, but it seems like it's kind of losing popularity. Um, Tableau does have a download option, but oftentimes it's not clear what you're downloading. So I remembered um, when the bird flu outbreak was really bad, I downloaded data from Tableau to update, update the map of how many birds were being culled each week or whatever. And if I was on the incorrect tab, it would just download me a Excel sheet with just one record, which was one big number. It would be the same thing as downloading just the 3.3 number here. And that's like ridiculous, like that's not useful. So I had to figure out, okay, these things don't line up, but just poking around and figuring out, oh, this is the one that actually has all the data that I need with the culling by state by date. So I can download it and then turn it into a visualization. But yeah, Tableau is just not good at communicating what it means when it comes to downloading data and you could get some wacky things. Um, Esri data sets and dashboards are the one that I have screenshotted here. And they typically don't have a download button on them because I think they really grew in popularity following the COVID-19 pandemic. A lot of those county pages were built in Esri and because those health departments were, you know, afraid of people, you know, stealing my HIPAA information, they tended to be extremely um, careful when it came to releasing data. So in that case, they didn't have a download and instead had all the information that was going to be download, downloaded on a separate server, which you could access, but you needed to have a decent amount of data chops to get in there. Um, 
I understand government's uh, concern about not just putting data out there, but it is kind of frustrating to have to go through all these hoops to get things that fundamentally are ours. We paid them with our tax dollars, so they should be at least somewhat accessible, you know, more so than a dashboard. Um, there are other methods to get information off of dashboard dashboards. Um, there are some coding tools and there are some open source projects that um, journalists at the New York Times and the Washington Post have put together. Luckily, I haven't had to use those, but if it comes to it, um, I'm confident that I could figure out how to use those tools to extract data from a dashboard because a government or an organization decided to be not very transparent. All right, that's the main part of my presentation. So in this, I also have some more links which also includes some textbooks um, from Matt Waite, a data journalist professor at uh, the University of Nebraska-Lincoln. And I highly recommend the Math with Spreadsheets for Reading Reporters. It's just a helpful refresher on the basics that you need to know for doing basic math for your stories. And if you want to get more advanced, um, take a look at the data journalism using the tool R and the Tidyverse, which is actually the course that I'll be teaching next semester um, at UNL. Uh, I'm not terrified at all. It'll be fine. And of course, um, there are IRE tip sheets uh, about specific subjects that I or uh, Kayvon or anyone else who's an IRE member can download. All right, that's all that I got. If you have any questions, feel free to ask. Go ahead, Cassidy. Hi, uh, thanks for doing this. Um, this is a kind of a supplemental question to the training, but often I'll look at stories and I feel like sometimes I don't notice or I don't naturally see where where data can be brought in. So I guess if you have any, what are some kind of questions or thoughts we should think about when we're going through our stories and trying to figure out if there's a data component? I think it really depends on the scope and size of the story. Like if you're doing something that's just daily or something that's just like a spot, I don't think it's really necessary to try to force data into something that is meant to be short, uh, both on air and digitally. But if you're doing a feature story, there is often at least some form of context that could be useful to add, be it demographic information, historical information about whatever you're, you're talking about. But basically the, the red flag that you should realize is if you're writing a story and you find yourself with a paragraph that has more than two numbers in it, maybe it's better to take that out of the paragraph and put it in a visualization um, or a table or something um, because it's just easier for our eyes to understand. Um, we can visualize a change between 17 and 45% much easier than reading that thing. So um, I would just recommend just keeping an eye out when you're writing and that's when it may appear. But most of the time it is context if you're not doing a story that's kind of driven from a database. One uh one rule of thumb that I well a couple of rules of thumb is if you're trying to if you to, to I agree with uh, Daniel's number thing if you start typing out lots of percentages and you're saying this happened in 2017 and today it's this and five years ago that is a clue but also I think about if you're trying to give context of an issue over time that is a clue. Um, so this is how high rent was in Lincoln for a two bedroom in 2017. Here's where it was in 2020 during the pandemic. And here's where it is now that again, anything that you're trying to show. And even if you don't use, you, obviously you're not using a data visualization on the radio, but you may need to, for yourself, figure out from the data that you have what you can extract and say quickly and succinctly in a radio story. So um, so that's another area that Daniel could probably help you like winnow down what you're trying to say. But so anything that's sort of over time, um, when you're trying to compare a numbers that are changing over time, like trends, um, that's a good one. Also, um, anything where you're looking at um, amounts of things like prices or population or um, anything that changes over time that, that again, it's an overtime thing, comparing something to another thing, like this is how many people live in, uh, subsidized housing in Wichita versus Topeka versus Lawrence. I mean, you want to think about your comparisons, um, in that way as well. So, so that's, that's what I, those are a couple of rules of thumb that I think about. Um, and another thing is too. Um, a lot of times you may have noticed that some of the spot stories that go out that we send out um, for the region are really starting with data. 
So this is how many people are smoking. This is how many people are using vaping. This is how many, this is how, um, how mortgage rates are going for the region. And so a good, uh, some of these, um, <coughs> excuse me, data sets that agencies put out are quite interesting data stories and whether we do uh, stories for your for the audience and whether you do it, whether we do it or you just do it for Lincoln or you just do it for Omaha, that is a way of starting a story. And then that nugget might turn into a feature later on or something more in depth, because now, you know, oh, um, or you could say something like, you know, there's a bill in the legislature in Lincoln that's been up for a vote seven years in a row. Here's what happened to it over time. I mean, wouldn't that be an interesting way to visualize something? Excuse me, I had to cough. <laughs> um, but anyway, those are those are some things that I think about um, with data. Um, I'm I wanted to say that that the a couple of tools that really stood out to me in this presentation were when you get that um, that sort of photograph of, or that screen grab of something. That's a I mean that's very common, um, even handwriting. So I would definitely make sure you can under you understand that tool. And the other one was the, um, I can't remember now, I was gonna make a note of it, but um, but think of the things that you come across the most. It's a lot of information that you don't need to try to master all of it, but think of the things that you come across, try to master those a little bit. And then Daniel, of course, is available when, um, when you have questions. Daniel, I have a question. Um, I, and I think a lot of us sometimes come across these uh, dashboards, like you mentioned, that appear to be organizations showing transparency or agencies showing transparency. And uh, sometimes it is helpful. You can kind of see some trends and whatnot, but sometimes it's just a bombardment of information and different breakdowns when we only need a certain few things or we want to play with it, how we do it. And I've asked for numbers in the past and been told, well, here it is on the dashboard. How do you go about asking for these files or and is that something that you can help us with when we're doing that? Yeah, I guess the first thing I do is um, use a little bit of my dark magic here and just see if I can find the underlying data set. Um, sometimes they have it on servers. Um, honestly, the people who set up the, the GIS dashboards tend to not be the most um, secure, I guess is the way to put it. Um, I'd say nine times out of 10, I'm, I'm able to find it one way or another. Um, if that doesn't work, I would probably communicate with the PIO with screenshots, just like, hey, am I doing this correct? I'm asking you because I don't want to be wrong. And just framing it as I'm being a careful journalist and they're more likely to play along that way. Um, I think the biggest thing we should be concerned about is if a, a dashboard is like consistently updated because when you screenshot something that could change. So it's important to consider that or we have to be careful of like, you know, this as of this time or this day was this. Yeah, I think I, that's what I tend to do, Chris. Like when they 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 send this dashboard and you're supposed to be excited about it, I will call the person whose name is on the email and I'll say, these are the questions that are not answered by that dashboard. Can I get that? And um, like Daniel said, sometimes they're like, well, you know, you got to, you know, we don't have that or they will give it to you. But um, that's what that's what I usually do. I wanted to show um, an example for those of you who who've been looking at the behind the um, behind the, uh, curtain version of uh, some of this, of what some examples may look like in the finished product. This is um, this is a, obviously an investigation, but, um, oops, that's not what I wanted to do. Uh, but I wanted to just take you through what some of these things look like and why we chose these things. So for example, um, we showed, uh, Daniel, what, what tool did you use for this one right here? So this is, uh, we, it's kind of, this is like seven tools. Um, so we, we <laughs> used um, uh, Excel to, to combine all of the locations. So I had a list of location and addresses from the 11 counties we looked at. And then I imported that into the census, um, into a GIS with the Tiger database of the shape files of the census tracks, joined those, did a spatial join, which is the GIS way of, counting a thing in a space. And then it was able to extract that data further into the um, scatter plot that's further down. 
but the way that you're viewing this is an open street map tool that Brent built with um, specific raster tiles of just the Midwest. So this is a mapping service that only shows the universe we care about rather than having a entire world behind it. Because if you actually scroll out of the Midwest, it'll be nothing. Um, yeah. Hopefully that answered your question and didn't go too far. No, that's great because I, I'm trying to show people kind of what these things can be used for and why you wouldn't do it for everything. But in this case, we really wanted to show a couple of things for each city and we wanted people to be able to just focus on that one city and not have to like look at a Google map that's going to pull out and pull in and get confusing. And so you see we have income here. We have a location, very sort of um, clean and easy to use. And then this little guy over here is a much a much more basic one. But we also, again, this is an example of comparing things, right? Um, to write all this in a in a um, paragraph would would be like people's eyes would start to cross and they click out of the story. But if you can put it in a in a, in a visualization like this, average rent, boom, 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 right? That is a very again a very simple data wrapper, elegant, right? And then we did this is the the this is where we looked at census tracts and and again you can look at Omaha, St. Louis, and Kansas City by color. You've got your medium household income. You've got race. You've got there's so a lot of things that are going on in here that you can be looking at uh, so that it, that tell you about this company's behavior in a market. So that's another one. And then we have right. Again, another more simple one, right? This is an example of that trend I talked about growing over time, right? You want to show the 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 quite explosive growth of this company in the two year period of time, right? And that's what we really wanted to show. This company, it's not something that's been around for fifty years and slowly they're amassing thousands and thousands of properties. They have made this huge buy in 2021 in all these cities. And now they're up to here. And actually we're working on a follow-up on this one. So stay tuned. Kayvon is um, knee deep in that one. Um, so those are some different examples of, um, sorry, photo, of different ways that we've used that. And then I wanted to show you a, um, a simpler way that, a simpler piece of data that was, um, Again, something that's used in a in a daily story that um, we had today about happens to be about rent again. Um, so are you seeing rents in Kansas City? Is that what we're seeing? Um, so here is again lots of numbers, lots of numbers. Boom! Now we can see something in a snapshot format. Rent burden in Missouri. How many people are rent burdened? How many people spend more on more than thirty percent of their rent? of their income on rent. And it's a really interesting way of looking at that issue because the 30% is really what the conventional wisdom says, you shouldn't spend more than that on rent. And we're finding that that is not, um, that is not really an, a thing anymore, it's gone over that. So again, that's another um, way. And here's another, again, comparing things, right? Homeowner versus renters by race. This is very telling because it's, it still shows you that inequity that exists within the housing and um, very simple. We're not talking about maps. We're not talking about swooping in on one city or another, but we're showing that comparison that's really easy for anyone to consume. Um, and then here we have Kansas homeowners versus renters, again, by race, also very telling. So um, again, these are things that, um, that we can help you do with the data that you get, if you get it then, and you're like, I don't know what any of this means. Um, and we can also help you figure out how to work it into your radio so that it's not a hot mess of data and numbers that you're trying to put onto the radio, but you can succinctly, um, Chris is very good at this, by the way. Um, you can succinctly kind of say, this is the trend, but think about where your story lives for the long haul. It lives online and people may wanna go back to it. And the more that you can give them in that um, user experience, with interesting data that's easy to consume, um, the likelier that your story will be shared, read, read again. Um, and so think about that experience that the person who's reading your story has. Dan, uh, Brian, do you have a question? Yes, you're unmuted. Oh, I'm sorry. I just joined <laughs> from my phone to my computer. So. Oh, okay. <laughs> uh, so that's an interesting um, example as well. 
Um, can you think of any other examples we've done recently, Daniel, that kind of show what you were talking about? I'm trying to think myself what, uh, let's see here, go to Midwest Newsroom. Uh, uh, oh, here's uh, tobacco products. This is again, this is a story that I got because someone uh, from um, the American Lung Association sent this report and it's got full of really interesting information. And so we found out that our region gets mostly F grades for tobacco use, right? So that was, again, something I, I said to Daniel, here's the things that I want to show. And then he might come back to me and go, well, do you want it laid out this way or this way? Like, and so we'll talk a little bit about it. I usually defer to his, um, his uh, layout and decisions there. Percent of adults who smoke. Again, you can isolate each state. So again, when you're trying to compare, and even if you're doing a story that is just about Nebraska, it can be extremely useful to provide your viewers or your readers with context, right? So here's another state that has the same population as Nebraska, and here's how they're spending money on road construction. Um, or here's another city that's the same as Lincoln, and they consume X number of more, more water than Lincoln consumes. So it doesn't have to be a Midwest newsroom story or a regional story for you to think about explaining things. And especially too, like in Missouri, Kansas City and St. Louis are constantly being compared, right? And people want to know, well, wonder, wonder what they're doing over in St. Louis, you know? So think about that comparison for context. Again, you know, um, it's, it's about providing the reader of your story with more than just the narrow picture of what you're telling them, but some insight and context to it. So that's another reason to use uh, data visualization, Cassidy, to your question, is when you're trying to show, you know, Nebraska is not an outlier here, or Nebraska is an outlier here in this particular case. And here's some, some simple comparisons that we can show you there. And that's another great um, way to, to look at. And there's, I, we didn't, I didn't do a graphic for that one. Um, and that's another great reason to use data. And again, it can be, it doesn't have to be a huge investigation to use it. Um, it can simply be, a, a, you you want to bring life and more more information to your daily digital story. So I'll get off my 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 TEDx soapbox about about um, what you need to put in your digital pieces. Are there any other questions? Does everybody here know how to get a hold of Daniel? Oh yeah, go ahead, Brian. My question is last one. Maybe it's for Daniel, uh, but. <laughs> My question is just if looking for guidance on um, how to get our newsroom reporters and editors to be thinking about this, because oftentimes, I, oftentimes by the time it gets to me, it's well down the the uh, conveyor belt, and like we we're talking about, I, I, I know we don't want to think about using data as a service desk, um, and how to get data involved earlier on in the process um any do we, do we, and this is something that, that we've struggled with here even as we had a data journalist for the entirety that I've been that i've been here um so i know in some parts it's a culture thing but also i'm just looking to see what else is uh what else is working <laughs> yeah i think um you could look to young will bauer of how to do it correctly um he has the sauce and can do it um, and I also think maybe it's a little bit more pressure on your content editors to step up their game on digital stuff because, you know, it's about setting expectations and being consistent. And there's a time where we say yes and a time where we say no. So I think it's just having that ongoing conversation. Um, it would be the same thing as like, you know, why didn't this story get published online? It would air on the radio. It's It should be kind of considered in that realm, but it does take consistent conversation to have people have the realization that's what's going on. And obviously St. Louis, you have many more editors than Nebraska does. So it's a different scenario. So it's kind of a different approach depending on the output and the size of your organization. And, and I do think that editors will ask, well, how do you know that? That's, that's a question that we always ask our reporters, right? And the reporter might say, well, I have this data that says 50% of da-da-da-da. And it's, that, then that's a clue to the editor, oh, 
what else other data do you have? So I think I do think it, it's the, the question that the, the editors add to their checklist when they're working on um, when they're working with and and it can benefit the audio as well because you you're you don't want to put a lot of numbers in your audio but you want to be able to say in an audio piece you know the reason why we're doing the story for the host intro you might say did you you know most Missourians may not know that you cannot um, you cannot get a divorce in Missouri if you're pregnant which I just learned by the way. Um, and data shows that, um, that I think it was a case you are, um, segment, uh, data shows that, you know, X number of women are waiting to get pregnant. I mean, waiting to get divorced. So like even just the host intro, that nugget of like, whoa, 90%, you know, that, to, that to me should spark something in an editor who says, oh yeah, let's use that in the host intro. And then we've got all this other data. We can, we can talk to Daniel and like figure out what we want to put in the, the, the story. I've had to learn that I've had to, I mean, that's a, a piece of muscle that I've had to learn, which is what data do we have? Um, and sometimes I don't know what I don't know. So that's when I say to Daniel, I don't know, <laughs> or Kayvon, you know, what do you, what's the data? What are the records? What's going on? So you know, we can do a training for editors if that's something that people want, you know, would like to do. We, we're happy to do that because I think that um, uh, most of our trainings are are attended by reporters. And, and if they need that, they do need that um, reinforcement um, from from and it can be it can start small. It doesn't have to start with a Vinebrook story that has eight visualizations in it, but like a, a story that's going to that someone's going to put some time into doing a digital version. And it's, you know, they may know 24 hours ahead of time. And in that time, Daniel can also help them with something visual there. Can I can I jump in real fast? Um, just totally anecdotal, but, um, you know, a good example. Yesterday, I was talking with a with a reporter um, at St. Louis Public Radio, and they were sort of pitching me sort of a, a story that they, th that they wanted to work on. And part of it was like, well, I've heard a couple of people are getting rejected to do this X thing. I've heard from a couple of people. I said, well, how many, how many people is it? a couple? I'm like, well, that's good anecdote, but like, have you done any records requests to find out, you know, is this a trend? Are there enough, uh, you know, like to actually make a story or is this just something you're hearing? Um, and I think that's the questions the editors need to ask. The editors need to know like, okay, you have a anecdote from a few people who have complained to you. What data is out there that can back your story up to make it a better story? So I think like that's the whole mindset. The editors really need to be thinking. And that's something that Daniel has kind of, I think, helped teach all of us. Is like there's, you know, I think at IRE and I think Daniel, they, they call it a data uh, a document or data uh, driven mindset that everything out there, every story you work on, and not every story needs this, has documents or some sort of data to back it up. So if someone's saying, yeah, this board is rejecting a bunch of people unfairly, well, there's got to be some documentation of all those rejections. So go find that, and then we can make some data out of it. Um, and that's where I think it just has to be the editors and the reporters having that conversation. Yeah, that's, that's a good example. Sorry, I would jump on and add um, that I feel like the Midwest newsroom is is with its last two um, data digests that it's been sending out. We're working on this sort of from the opposite angle. So absolutely, we need to get editors in the in the habit of asking the numbers question early in the process. But for you guys sending us charts that that um, are relevant to stuff that our beat reporters are working on, we can like force this conversation from the other direction as well. And I think just the more people get used to including these visuals in their stories, the more, you know, what you're saying, Holly, about just making them more interesting to, to digital audiences, I think we'll see that reflected in in uh, traffic. And, you know, we, I, 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 I feel like I say this all the time, but I'll say it again, you know, give us your request. Like if you know, if the next data, data digest is coming in March, what's happening in March that people will benefit from no matter what station they're on. And the, what's that data? Is it about women? It's about basketball. I think it's basketball. Okay. And women, I mean, women, it's women's month. I think um, there's another one. Um, women's basketball. Hey, right there. You got, you got Iowa interested, Kansas interested, Nebraska interested women in sports. Maybe that's a thing. Right. Um, but we, we are, we, when we don't have requests, we're in a vacuum and we just decide. Right. And it just happened that you guys that two stations did housing stories this month. So that was great. 
but that was kind of just, you know, <laughs> that was just fate or, or that was just coincidence. So, you know, anybody can sort of raise their hand and give us some suggestion about what that data digested look like, because we really, we don't want Daniel to be doing work that doesn't help you. And we don't want you all to need something that we're not providing. And quite aside from the data digest, you should know that Daniel is here to help, he, you know, Harvest, you know, uses him all the time. And these are, you know, for their feature stories. And so um, please uh, just, if you want to just talk to him about what's available, he's available to do that. He's got office hours, but he's also just here as well and, and reachable. So, um, you know, just, just think in those terms. Um, thanks CJ, we're about to wrap up anyway. Um, but yeah, that's that's my again another soapbox situation. But I see a couple editors on here. If for any reason you think it would be helpful for an editor's session on data, let's um, we can we can put that together um, maybe after the legislative session is over. Um, I know that's that's a big one for some of us, but um, yeah. Thanks, and Daniel. Just going back to what Brian was saying, I think this is the similar conversation you have about photos. Like if you're doing a long story, that's when you need to have those good photos. But if you're doing something that's just a quick turn, it could be a stock photo. Um, so I think that may be a mindset that can convince some editors who are resident to kind of have this conversation. That's true. That's a good point. And subheads. I'm a big fan of subheads. Okay. <laughs> All right, everybody. Thank you. And we'll be sending out the video link. And um, you got the link for the um, the presentation in the chat. So thanks again. Bye.